Hello, I am Dr. R. D. Khare, pediatrician from Mumbai. Today we will revise our knowledge about hemiplegia. Weakness of a part of body, if it is weak or mild, then it is hemiparesis. If it is severe, it is known as hemiplegia. Hemiplegia is as a result of involvement of pyramidal tract. However, when the patient complains of hemiplegia, and we approach the problem, we must make sure of two or three things. Sometimes he may have more involvement of upper arm and he may have involvement of lower arm but he doesn't complain of it. So if he complains of involvement of one arm, make sure that the other arm is normal and it is not a part of hemiplegia. Or if he complains of weakness of one leg, make sure that it is not a part of paraplegia. Or if he complains of weakness on one side, Make sure the other side is also normal or it doesn't have some athetosis or other involuntary movements. Having confirmed that, we come to the hemiplegia. Hemiplegia is as a result of involvement of pyramidal tracts. We start from cortex, the motor cortex, the precentral gyrus and they come down to the brain into the spinal cord and they end up at the motor nerve nuclei in the spinal cord. At the level of, of the medulla, the fibers on two, two sides cross known as decussization. Now this particular fact we are going to keep in mind for explanation. Now we want to find out where is the lesion in the entire pyramidal tract. And for that we are going to make use of A the decussation level and B the origin of cranial nerve nuclei. So cranial nerve nuclei come out of the brain stem and the decussation lockers at the level of medulla. So we have three levels, one from cortex to the brain stem, one is in brain stem itself and one is below the level of medulla. Now if the lesion is from the cortex to the midbrain then it is cortex, subcortical area and internal capsule. What are the characteristics of a cortical lesion? Since cortex is represented by a very large area, therefore entire affection of hemi, uh, entire affection of half of the body is uncommon. Therefore, a small area of the body may be involved. Let's say only the arm or only the leg. And because it's a cortical lesion, therefore there may be altered sensorium and most importantly seizures. So with this, we separate a cortical lesion from other like subcortical lesion. Is subcortical lesion, the sensorium may not be disturbed or minimally disturbed and there may be no seizures. In sense, in subcortical lesion, the pyramidal tracts gradually converse and come down to the internal capsule. This therefore, the way they will differ from cortical area is absence of seizures and sensorium and let us say consider below the medulla which is spinal cord here the lesion is on the same side because it is after the crossing so in spinal hemiplegia the lesion and the hemiplegia is on the same side so after decussation the lesion and the hemiplegia is on the same side above that the lesion and hemiplegia are opposite to each other now coming to the lesion between the midbrain and the medulla. We take the help of cranial nerve nuclei. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the cranial nerve nuclei arise from that. So at the level of the lesion, that particular cranial nerve nucleus will be affected and therefore that cranial nerve will have palsy. And because the cranial nerve nucleus is affected, therefore the palsy will be of the lower motor neuron type of palsy. Therefore, at the level of midbrain, if there is a lesion, in it is at the level of third nerve nucleus, there will be third nerve palsy of the nuclear type or the lower motor nerve type. And the hemiplegia is on the opposite side because the, that has taken place after crossing. So there is what is known as crossed hemiplegia. So in cerebral lesions, the hemiplegia is on one side caught and the lesion is on the other side. In spinal lesion, the lesion and the hemiplegia is on the same side. And in midbrain lesion, 
there is involvement of cranial nerve on one side and hemiplegia on the other side like crossed hemiplegia. So this is how we find it easy to localize the lesion between the cortex and spinal cord. Now, having localized the lesion, we also want to find out the cortical area as a large area. Is there only the cortical or cortex, motor cortex involved or other part of cortex? Are? For that, we take the help of blood supply of the brain that is middle anterior and posterior cerebral arteries. Middle cerebral artery involves the middle portion of the brain, the cortical area, subcortical that we saw just now. Anterior cerebral artery, the characteristics are A, the sphincters are involved. Please remember sphincters are not involved in the classical medial artery part. And in addition, there is some return of some reflexes like palmo-mental reflex. There may be little confusion and this is how anterior cerebral artery separates itself from the post. And the posterior part of the brain we know is concerned with vision. So visual disturbances, color blindness, etc. distinguish the posterior region. So this is how we further divide the cortical area into that affected by anterior, middle and cerebral artery. So we have now localized the cortical area and lower areas. Now we want to find out what is the lesion. So we know where is the lesion, we want to find out what is the lesion. Etiology. We take the gross etiologies which is stroke, infection and neoplasm. For the time being this is enough. What is a stroke? This is loss of brain function in an area where the blood supply is disturbed. Blood supply comes from arteries. Therefore. If the arteries are involved, the blood supply is involved. How can the artery and blood supply be involved? Thrombosis, embolism and hemorrhage. Thrombosis, common uh, problem as a common pathology. What are the characteristics of thrombosis? Usually occurs in middle aged people, usually occurs in sleep. But most important thing we are going to consider origin, duration and progress. Origin is over a few hours. Duration may last that many hours and progress is stuttering progress going on. That means there may be some involvement of one part of the body, then little later other part of the body. So stuttering progress over a period of hours is and onset is relatively certain is likely to be thrombosis. Embolism. We know embolism is going to be sudden because embolus comes from somewhere. So sudden onset and there is no further regression, there may be no progression, but it does not improve. And there may be some other underlying cause to explain the thromboembolism, like subacute bacterial endocarditis or valvular heart disease. Then we come to hemorrhage. Oh, when there is bleeding, there is likely to be catastrophe. There may be a larger area of brain involved. There may be increased intracranial pressure and often vomiting and the sensoria may be affected if a large area is involved. This is how hemorrhage is different. So though all of them develop over a period of time, the thromb thrombosis over a few hours, embolism and hemorrhages are sudden. Embolism is localized, hemorrhage is more catastrophic. There's one more thing like in thrombosis, it can be an arterial thrombosis or venous thrombosis. Cavernous sinus is affected. Since the cavernous sinus is affected, there is a lot of back pressure and a lot of edema of a large portion of, of, this, uh, of the brain. Therefore, there may be significant alteration of the brain function and the area involved does not confer to the area of artery because it is not an arterial. So, this is how venous thrombosis separates, you will say, from the arterial. Now, we come to the other causes like infection and, and neoplasm. Infection takes place over a period of time and it is associated with fever but it takes a few days for the infection to develop. So while in vascular it is either sudden or over hours, infection is over days. In addition associated sign of cerebral dysfunction, headache, vomiting, presence of fever makes it an infection. Tumor. Tumor now develops over weeks so few hours few days and few weeks and also it spreads in different area. So both it does not produce or it does not restrict itself 
to a particular area of distribution of an artery or vein or pyramidal tract or sensory tract because it may involve many and also there may be affection of the intracranial pressure there may be signs of raised pressure so this is how we commonly separate different etiologies the common etiologies of course there are many other things which are there like for example hemiplegic cerebral palsy where the insult occurs in the intrauterine and perinatal period or the infantile hemiplegia which is not uncommon a vascular lesion which may be alternating recurring or improving and again occurring moya moya syndrome which is again middle cerebral artery which progresses and not to forget migraine migraine can also affect hemiparesis develops over a period of time diagnosis is easy in the presence of migraine or there may be epilepsy associated with hemiplegia and clear history of seizures will separate it from seizure related uh, hemiplegia. I think this revises our knowledge of hemiplegia. Thank you very much.